Throughout history, silver has been used as money in more times and more places than gold. To function as money, a monetary item should possess a number of features. It needs to be a medium of exchange. It should have the liquidity and be easily tradable. It should be easily transportable. Precious metals have a high value to weight ratio, and it should be durable. To be a unit of account, it should be divisible into small units without destroying its value. Precious metals can be coined from bars or melted down into bars again with a low percentage cost. It should be fungible, that is, one unit or one piece is equivalent to another unit, which is why diamonds and works of art and real estate are not suitable as money. It must have a specific weight or measure or size to be certifiably accountable. The third feature is that it needs to be a store of value. It should be long-lasting, durable, and it must not be perishable or subject to decay. It should have a stable value. It should be difficult to counterfeit, and the genuine must be easily recognizable. Today's silver is not used as money since it does not circulate, but it still provides a crucial role as a store of value. Why do silver and gold have value? Why is gold worth some 20 bucks an ounce? I don't know, because it's scarce. A thousand men say go searching for gold. After six months, one of them's lucky, one out of the thousand. His find represents not only his own labor, but that of 999 others to boot. That's uh, 6,000 months or 500 years, scrabbling over mountains, going hungry and thirsty. Now, to gold, mister, is worth what it is because of the human labor that went into the finding and the getting of it. Now, think about how much energy, labor, ingenuity, and time that goes into finding that silver and refining it. The mining company produces silver bars, the composition of which is 93 to 97 percent pure silver. It sells the bars to a refinery, which further purifies them for sale to industries. The action begins down in the mine, where geologists point a niton gun at various spots in the rock face. The device detects the levels of 40 different elements, including silver. Silver in its natural state isn't silver colored at all, it's charcoal gray. Those silver looking deposits are actually zinc and lead. Miners drill holes in the silver rich areas the geologists pinpointed then insert sticks of dynamite. After the blast, carts haul the chunks of rock, called ore, to the surface. Geologists then test ore piles and blend them as required to achieve a consistent amount of silver content per kilogram of ore. The ore first goes into the primary crusher. The machine's huge steel teeth break up the big chunks into smaller pieces. Those pieces then drop through grates below into the secondary crusher, which breaks them down into even smaller pieces. Those go into vibrating cone crushers, which pulverize them into tiny pieces. A conveyor transports the crushed ore to the ball mill. At this point, the ore pieces are roughly six millimeters big. As the mill's large cylinder rotates, steel balls bounce around inside, grinding the ore into powder. A water circulation system flushes the silver-rich powder out of the cylinder and into large tanks which keep the water moving. To separate and dissolve the metals the powder contains, workers pour in acid. 72 hours later, the rock waste now settled at the bottom. The solution containing dissolved silver is pumped through filter presses. The filter plates are treated with a zinc-based chemical which attracts silver molecules. As the solution passes through, the plates trap particles containing silver, forming a layer of black powder called silver precipitate. This precipitate is composed of approximately 50% silver and 50% waste, the waste being a jumble of various metals, dirt, and other impurities. To separate the silver from the waste, they first dry the precipitate in a gas furnace for a couple of hours. In the mining company's lab, technicians continuously test ore samples to determine the grade, the term for the quantity of silver per kilogram of ore. They heat the samples to 1,093 degrees Celsius for about an hour to burn off the impurities. What's left after the burn off are the silver and other metals, such as lead, zinc, copper, selenium, and cadmium. 
Lab technicians then treat the samples with a chemical that prevents silver from burning off and put them back in the oven. When the samples come out about an hour later, all the other metals have burnt off and only silver is left. They weigh the silver and compare it to the weight of the original sample in order to calculate the grade. The key to running a profitable mine is to ensure that the grade is consistently within certain parameters. Back at the mill, workers put the now dried silver precipitate into an oven along with chemicals which prevent silver from burning off. Approximately four hours later, the silver and waste have separated and melted. Workers pour them into bar-shaped molds. The silver, being heavier, settles at the bottom. Workers skim off the waste floating on top. In less than five minutes, the molten silver cools and hardens, enabling workers to extract what is now a silver bar. The mining company sells the bars to a refinery for processing into industrial-grade silver. It's crazy to think that all those tons of earth were moved just to find one ounce of silver, and right now we can buy it all for less than a dinner for four at our local sports bar.